all of it. And nowadays, I would say, because we can provide access through 6,000 hertz, that really it's essential to have access through 6,000 hertz if at all possible. So we've talked about frequency. Let's talk about intensity. When we look at the audiogram, we've, we've looked here in terms of these frequency bands for different speech sound types or different features. Let's talk about where these, these cues lie on the intensity scale. When we think about speech acoustics, there's two ways to think about speech acoustics. So far, we've been talking about the short-term components of speech acoustics or speech production. These are the speech sound types, specific speech sounds, ooh, ee, ah, ba, da, ga, or speech sound types, vowels, nasals, liquids, etc. Or we could talk about speech features, voicing, constant place, constant manner. But another way to think about speech acoustics, and it's a way that we particularly think about when we're talking about the intensity of speech, are the long-term components. Looking at the overall frequency and intensity of connected speech. And in fact, an important measurement that we use in our own practice as listening and spoken language professionals is the long-term average speech spectrum, or the LTASS. Now, the long-term average speech spectrum is obtained, has been obtained through multiple research studies whereby speakers were recorded either engaged in conversation or in reading specific passages that are selected to have known phonemic components so that all speech sounds are represented. Generally, speech is recorded from a distance of one meter, which in the U.S. is approximately three feet or 3.2 feet. Each speaker's output is measured for the intensity and frequency ranges obtained across the duration of that connected speech sample. And then those values for each individual speaker were averaged to get this long-term average speech spectrum you keep talking in connected speech and you get information about the frequency and intensity range of speech. What's important about this research is that it can be replicated and that it has been replicated cross-linguistically across different languages. So we can apply it across a variety of linguistic communities. What do we know? from studies of the long-term average speech spectrum. We know that the intensity range of speech at approximately 3 feet ranges on the dBHL scale from about 30 to 70 dBHL. We think of soft speech as being around 30 dBHL, conversational speech at 50, loud speech at 70. The frequency range of speech in these measurements has been cited as being from 1,000 to 15,000 hertz. Um, you'll see that it's truncated a little bit when we look at how it appears on the audiogram. The strongest intensity of speech lies in the mid-frequencies of these frequency range, about where the vowel ah is, and this long-term average speech spectrum takes the shape of a banana what we know of as the speech banana. So this lovely uh, audiogram with familiar sounds comes from the John Tracy Clinic, and I urge you, if you haven't, to go to their website and look at all their wonderful um, resources. It was originally published by Northern and Downs um, in their various editions of uh, um, hearing in children 
Um, and there are some items on this audiogram that I think is important for us to, to think about. The speech banana is here. You'll see that it ranges from a little bit below 250 hertz to actually a little bit above 8,000 hertz. We see that the low frequencies appear at softer intensities than the mid frequencies, and likewise the higher frequencies appear at softer intensities than the mid frequencies. Um, high frequencies are a little bit um, softer than the low frequencies. Now, often on one of these um, speech banana audiograms, we see individual speech sounds. I'm just pointing my cursor to individual speech sounds here. And sometimes we see, for example, the E represented twice for the first foreman of E, and we might see an E maybe over here around 2,000 hertz for the second form of, of E. It's, it's not here on this audiogram. Do understand that these individual speech sounds were not obtained through research obtaining the speech banana or the LTASS. Those are based on other research that looks at the intensity from spectrograms of speech sounds um, in, in spoken language. They're plotted onto the audiogram in addition to the speech banana. And my hope is that after listening to these lectures, you will find the um, placement of these individual sounds as um, somewhat questionable as I do. I mean, yes, the z and the v have quite a bit of energy here um, at 250 hertz because they're voiced. But we also know that there's turbulent information up here in the high frequencies. There's place information up here in the higher frequencies. So it's um, the placement of these speech sounds here has a certain amount of appeal. It's useful. We see that the F and the S and the TH we're seeing energy up here in the higher frequencies. It's useful for its explanatory power, but this is not necessarily where you want to be getting your specific, specific information in terms of trying to apply speech acoustics in your practice. But the speech banana, yes. Now, let's just think about, however, what we know about different speech features and their acoustic characteristics. So, super segmentals, voicing, and vowel jaw height as well as the F1 for um, jaw movement for glides we said was from 125 to 500 hertz. If we think about consonant manner and we think about the primary frequency range for consonant manner at 500 hertz according to Ling, the secondary at 1000 hertz the tertiary at 2000 hertz, we see here on the speech banana that consonant manner is represented really solidly in the middle of this range. But we also know that there's manner information down up here in the high frequencies and down here in the lowest frequencies. In terms of place, our primary region for vowel place, front versus back, and for consonant place of articulation, we say is at 2,000 hertz, with secondary information around 4,000 hertz. But we also know that full place information ranges from about 6,000 down to 1,000 hertz. So let's look at this audiogram. And I've simply plotted a left ear unaided audiogram. And the question being, what frequencies are audible to the listener? Now, you are probably already comfortable 
in recognizing that everything in intensities softer than these threshold levels is not audible to the listener, which means that this aspect of the speech banana um, is audible to the listener, as are all of these other louder sounds, because they are stronger in intensity than the thresholds for this listener. But let's ask ourselves some things. For example, um, information from 500 down through 250 hertz is stronger than this listener's threshold in the speech banana. Information around 1,000 hertz, sort of where manner is, um, it's sort of half of it's available to the listener and half is a little bit stronger than threshold. This listener can hear 2,000 hertz right on the outer edge of the speech banana. Does that mean that this listener has access to information at 2,000 hertz in the unaided condition? Um, remember, threshold means the definition of threshold is that the respondent only hears the signal 50% of all presentations. So this means that the listener is hearing 2,000 hertz information really only half the time. And that's at a distance in quiet of three feet. So we have to be careful if we just look at the unaided audiogram and some things to think about, some important things to consider. Aided or implanted hearing is more important than unaided hearing. I've chosen to show you an unaided audiogram because it's easy for us to see and also because aided hearing is these days recommended, the assessment of aided hearing is recommended to be in the form of speech perception as opposed to the aided sound field audiogram. And um, we can talk at the end of this lecture of where you can get more information about that. Um, but it's important to know what the individual hears with their hearing aids or with their cochlear implant. So we don't want to necessarily be making assumptions about a youngster's ability to process auditory information based on the unaided audiogram. I don't care about the unaided audiogram. What I care about is how they hear with the hearing aids or the implant. That's what we're working with. So make sure you have that information in your practice. The other important concept is the concept of sensation level. I'm going to go back to that audiogram again. And if we look here at 250 hertz, this listener, without their hearing aids at least, they, the speech banana um, is 10, we'll say that the lower edge of this speech banana is 10, 15 dB above threshold. We say that this point right here is a 15 dB sensation level. They're getting that much sensation at 250 hertz. At 500 hertz, they're getting a little bit less sensation. Certainly at 2000 hertz, hardly any at all. Now, what we find, what we find is that listeners, in order to have good comprehension, need to have a signal that is above their threshold, stronger than their threshold, at an adequate level above their threshold, at an adequate sensation level. And we also know that children require a higher sensation level or a stronger signal than adults. So sometimes when we look at aided hearing, um, we might think that it's 
adequate, that it's strong enough because um, a youngster can hear the speech banana, but maybe they can only hear the speech banana just above their threshold level. We want to make sure that we have pushed the audibility of speech such that it's at an adequate sensation level above their threshold. So just because a child can just hear speech doesn't mean that the child is receiving adequate speech information to learn to listen. And it might be that this child needs something other than conventional amplification, such as a cochlear implant. We must also consider distance. You've probably heard of the inverse square law. With every doubling of distance, you lose 6 dB. With every halving of difference, you gain 6 dB. And Ling's famous little saying was, come close to me, gain 6 dB. So I'm going to go back to this audiogram. And I'm going to look at this speech banana, which is plotted here as the intensity and frequency range of speech at a distance of about three feet. Well, if I get half that distance from the child to one and a half feet or 18 inches, I can make this whole speech banana stronger by about 6 dB. So the sensation level gets stronger. And then, that's about across the table from a child. But because I'm an auditory verbal therapist, I'm going to sit right next to that child. And I'm going to get half that distance at 9 inches. And I've gained another whole 6 dB on that speech banana. I'm getting that much more sensation level. All those aspects are getting stronger. And then if I think a child is having trouble with the sound, I'm just going to lean over and without raising my voice, or I might direct the parent to lean over without raising their voice and very quietly say what there is to say into the microphone of the child's hearing technology. And I've halved that distance again, and I've gained another 6 dB. So by moving from 3 feet to 18 feet to 9 inches to right next to the child's ear, I've gained 3 times 6 or 18, close to 20 dB, simply by positioning myself. So we have to be careful when we look at the audiogram and we start to make predictions about audibility that we don't shortchange that child's capacity um, by forgetting that we can manipulate distance. It's also, of course, important to counsel parents that distances greater than three feet really drop that signal and to have the conversation about staying within ear distance and the use of assistive technology. Now finally, I'm going to go back to that audiogram again. Finally, we've just looked at raw acoustics here. We've looked at the raw acoustics of speech sounds. We looked at the raw acoustics of the LTASS or the speech banana. But so far, we have not made any kind of judgment about which speech sounds might be more important than others with regard to speech perception. And we have to think about that when we're thinking about speech acoustics. So when we want to consider the importance of speech sounds, whether or not it's important to hear manner, or more important to hear place, or more important to hear constants versus vowels, we also need to consider the Speech Intelligibility Index, or the SII. The SII was formerly referred to as the Articulation Index. That might be a term you're more familiar with, and I think 
Still, it's important to know these terms interchangeably. The SII is an updated algorithm. And the SII is the proportion of speech information available to a listener. In other words, I'm going to go way back to this audiogram. If I look at this proportion of the speech banana, maybe that's maybe I could say that this listener hears about half of speech information. But maybe this part of the speech information isn't that important. So we want a calculation that says with this hearing loss or wearing this hearing aid or hearing with this cochlear implant, accessibility to speech or the amount of valuable speech information on a scale of 0 to 1 or 0 percent to 100 percent is this. Um, the way the speech intelligibility index it was calculated, there's been, there have been different ways. In one set of researches, um, listeners would listen to word lists or sentences, some sort of target stimuli, and bands frequency bands of speech would be taken out and scores would be taken as to how the performance decreased when you take out certain frequency ranges of speech. Another way this is assessed is by having the listener listen instead only to a little bit of speech. Not the whole thing with stuff taken out, but just a little band of speech and you get a score and then you start to increase the bandwidth of speech. This, the SII takes into account both the intensity and frequency range of speech or the LTASS but also the importance of different frequency ranges for speech perception. In general the, the um, result is that it's more important for the listener to be able to perceive consonants than to perceive vowels. The difference between fat and cat and pat is consonant information and those differences are important to a listener's ability to correctly perceive speech. Your prob you may be familiar with this kind of grass graph, the count the dot audiogram. This is a graphic representation of the SII and there are a hundred dots here and each one of these dots represents essentially 10 percent of speech information. So if you can hear from just below 250 Hertz all the way through 8,000 hertz, you're likely to get 100% of speech information. But because this is weighted in terms of importance, look at the density of dots. So look at the dots here in the low frequencies, and look at the dots here in the high frequencies, and we see a less dense region these are less dense regions than here from about 1,000 through 4,000 hertz. There's more dots here. And what this means is that information in the region from, I'm going to say, from 1,000 to 4,000 hertz is more important to good, accurate speech perception than, say, information at 250 or information at 8,000 hertz. So we not only can talk about the frequency ranges where speech features lie, but we can also keep in mind what we know about intelligibility and perception and say it's important for a listener to have hearing from 1 to 4,000 hertz. Some final thoughts for applications. I'll say this again. Use the aided or implanted hearing, not the unaided audiogram. And 
use that audiological information and your knowledge of speech acoustics to do three things. To anticipate, to explain, and to problem solve when you are working with children and their families. Now what do we mean about anticipation? When we look at audiological information, even before we are looking at the child, we're going to be anticipating some things. We'll be asking some questions. Which speech sounds or aspects of speech or features are going to be easy for that child to hear and to learn? Which will be audible but more difficult to hear and learn? And which do we suspect may not be accessible to that child? But we have to keep in mind, I've used the word anticipation very mindfully rather than predicting what the child can hear or not hear. We must assume hearing until the child proves otherwise. Because speech varies in terms of its actual frequency components and intensities with speaker, with distance, with familiarity of the lexicon that until the child shows us that they're having difficulty give it a try maybe you don't think the child can receive something because they can't hear at 6,000 Hertz but remember think about turbulence refrication it goes all the way down into the lower frequencies so be forewarned, but never limit a child until they show you that they need something other than hearing. We want to avoid self-fulfilling prophecies. We also use speech acoustics and knowledge of a child's hearing with their devices for the purpose of explanation. If there's an error in perception or understanding can it be explained by what is audible to the child? Can we explain it by, oh, I think that's, that's missing information. I think that I need to do next steps in problem solving to help the child hear this more clearly. Or is it that perhaps maybe I've used some language that the child is not familiar with? Maybe it's not hearing. Maybe it's that I need to do a better job at getting down to the level of the at that child's level. We also can use the knowledge of speech acoustics and a child's hearing with their technology to explain errors in speech production. Can these errors be explained by audibility? Is a child substituting one sound for another? Or is the child's imitation of my model? Can that be explained by what he can hear and what he's struggling to hear? Or am I expecting something from the child that is not appropriate to his developmental level or his motoric capacity at that age? Finally, we use speech acoustics and knowledge of a child's hearing with their technology and problem solving. Because just because a child shows us they're having difficulty doesn't mean we say, oh, can't do it. We say, how can I help them hear better? How can I make this sound learnable? The first stage, of course, is making sure the child is fit with optimal hearing technology. But once that's done, or when we're in the process of that, we can do some problem solving as educators and clinicians. We can move closer. We can join difficult to hear consonants with lip rounded vowels. If you remember way back when we were talking about vowels and I made the statement that lip rounding lowers all formants. Lip rounding lowers all frequency energy in the context of that lip rounded vowel. So if I have a consonant that is preceded by or following um, a lip-rounded vowel, the energy in that consonant is going to be driven down into lower frequencies. So pair that consonant with an oo, to, su, foo. See if that helps the child 
hear that frication better because you're going to make it lower. What are our lip rounded vowels in English? My favorites are U, U, and O. We use acoustic highlighting to help a child hear better. I put just a few things here. There are more. Acoustic highlighting is the, the topic of another conversation, but we increase the duration of vowels to give the child more processing time. We sing on a vowel to give the vowel intonational contour so the child can track those formants. We whisper voiceless phonemes so that the, so that the noise burst and the turbulence is made stronger. And we whisper those, those voiceless phonemes in syllables that are completely whispered. So we don't say p, ah, or t, ah. We say pa, ta, ka. The entire thing gets whispered. Remember the h has low frequency energy, and that's what that whispered vowel is. And the turbulence and the plosion is that much stronger than the rest of the of the syllables. So we so it's highlighted, it's made more salient. Continuance, we increase the duration. We make the f longer, the m mm longer, the n mm longer, and we bounce plosives so that the child gets that repeated experience of that noise burst. D, d, d. Now, that's not to say that every time you bring out the doggy, you say, this is your d, d, d dog. We only do this if we think a child needs it. We don't name our vehicles the bu, 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 bus. It's a bus. And we might play with it, bu, bu, bu. Acoustic highlighting is a tool. It's not the primary component of our therapy. Thank you for joining me on this series of lectures, and thank you for letting me indulge myself with a little bit of talk about therapy at the end of this one. Again, if you would like a copy of these slides, you can go to the Dropbox with this material, or you can email me at helenmcmorrison at gmail.com. If you want to learn more about helping children with hearing loss and their families, um, you're welcome to look into the Listening and Spoken Language Strategies for Young Children with Hearing Loss series that's being published through Recipe SLP. These are inexpensive, very short ebooks, also available in print format um, for evidence-based strategies that pertain to listening and spoken language practice. And our first book from the series is now available, First Things First, Ensuring Auditory Access. And I had mentioned earlier in the lecture that if you want more information about how audiologists are now um, showing access to different frequency ranges with hearing aids through um, probe microphone measurements, for example, that's described in First Things First. Um, here's a list of the contents in the little book. And to, obtain, to order the book, you can go to recipeslp.com or at this particular moment, the most direct way is to go to amazon.com and conduct a search, an author search for Helen M. Morrison, and you will find the book. Thank you.